Hey, it's the Drive to School podcast. Hi, I'm Pastor Goodman. I'm the content executive at Higher Things, and joining me today is a brand new guest. I am here with Paige. How are you today, Paige? Good. How are you? I'm doing all right. Um, Paige and I, uh, we, we got to, to, to meet uh, and uh, become friends uh, talking on the internet about how easy it is to, to sort of offend people. Um, that's kind of a misnomer, but the idea that the way that we talk um, to each other uh, about complex uh, issues of the church is not necessarily the way that we talk to the rest of the world about it. And it's not because there's two different things going on, but well, why do we why do we maybe approach this a, a little bit differently to people who, who don't already have our, our beliefs and vocabulary? Okay, so um, we do as a church have a lot of theological vocab that we use as like a shorthand when we're talking to each other that definitely we understand. Like if I said something to you about like anything that has a certain theological ring to it, we'd be like, oh yeah, we get it. And someone else on the outside would be like, I have no idea what you guys are even talking about. So we always need kind of that base knowledge of, okay, here's what, for lack of better term, like layman's term to use for our theology. Right. That's actually apt. Um, and so it's, it's not even just, you know, uh, can you actually explain justification? That is, Jesus died for you, a sinner, and apart from any works of your own, you are saved. But, but also um, why it matters, actually, I, I think, too. Um, and how to, to actually address somebody who, who thinks other things matter. Um, it, it can be a sensitive conversation sometimes. And so um, I, I guess maybe even just sort of the idea then that... Um, you, you can sort of carry the idea that Jesus died for everybody. And so there is no more us versus them. Right. Right. Exactly. Like, um, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say um, it's a delicate thing because like we live in a culture that definitely equates like a disagreement with disrespect. And so when we go about talking to people like this like it is like you said very a delicate thing to do so um this is kind of where we hold firm in our faith and we um present the topic in a way that you can definitely disagree with someone but in a way in love that they know that you're not just slamming on them in an us versus them type way you said something that just kind of shook me. You said uh, disagreement in the world usually translates to disrespect. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's really, really profound. And I think it bears even talking about just a little bit more. Um, why do you think disagreement equals disrespect so many places? Um, wow, this is going to sound a little bit old timey person, but the internet. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because people are used to that instant gratification and they want to be like, is this right? Is this wrong? Yes, no, black, white. There is no gray area. You are either right and you know what you're talking about or you're wrong and you have no idea what you're talking about. So the world that we live in doesn't leave room for that gray area of disagreement. So right. it becomes disrespect. I think too, in in a lot of ways, identity gets so wrapped up with belief that um, it, it gets hard to sort of talk about a a belief without talking about the people that that cling to it. Um, and so, in a lot of ways, it's it's easy even for for Christians to to be offended if somebody were to say there is no such thing as Jesus and and your your sky god isn't real. Um, I, I've I've heard these things and. To, to recognize that somebody might have issues with an issue, but that doesn't mean that they actually have a problem with me. But it, it's hard because my, my righteousness, my justification, my being okay is, is sort of wrapped up in that. And you got to recognize the rest of the world has that too. And so if, if their entire identity is wrapped up in their sexual orientation or, or even just their political beliefs, and you, you disagree with those, well, then you disagree with their identity. You, you disagree with them as a person. So we have decided uh, that we're going to fix all of the problems in the world in 15 minutes, Paige. Um, <laughs> we're going to tackle something. We're going to call it mind the gap. We're, we're going to recognize that, that we can kind of come at these things from very different angles, but we want to do so in love. We, we want to do so sort of not with us versus them being the guiding principle, but but with the idea that the gospel actually means that, that talking to your neighbor uh, about these, these 
difficult topics is is something that that's worth pursuing with nuance and, and with with compassion and um and with the idea that you don't actually have to waver on the truth to actually try to understand somebody better but it maybe even might help you understand what you believe better and share it yeah exactly so um i, I guess even to do this um we got to talk about what truth is don't we yeah it's a simple word but like what's it mean <laughs> Well, um, so truth is something that's like it's in accordance with fact or reality. So um, you have two different types of truth. People usually go by the subjective truth, which is based off of mostly our perspective or our feelings or our opinions. Like you said, everything wrapped up in that identity. So the subjective truth could almost be called like an identity truth. Right. It, it's a truth from within because subjective mm-hmm. is from the inside out. Yeah. And then we have the objective truth, which I guess would be the opposite, the outside in. So it's true for everyone, whether they agree with it or not. Okay. And so I, I think for us uh, on sort of the, this side of the church, there's sort of a, a, a there's a great temptation to just uh, take subjective truth and just like light it on fire and laugh and point. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> Your feelings don't matter. And, and, and I should make you feel bad for even feeling feelings. And I'm going to tell you what's really true. Um, but, but there's a place for subjective truth, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Because like, um, it all comes in with your worldview and what you've experienced as a person. So like, for example, a subjective truth, easy subjective truth, um, like say 20 bucks to some person that could be a lot of money and they're rich. Yes. But another person, it's like, that's not all that much money. Yeah. Like, so that type of subjectivity is like something that's based off of your life experience. And that's perfectly fine. Like, that's where we get our subjective truth. Right. And, and I mean, it's, it's useful. So to be able to sort of say, um, even just like, I, I feel hot because it, it, I can tell you it's 90 degrees, but I feel hot is a personal thing because if you're from Texas, that's kind of comfortable. And if you're from the Midwest, that's not okay. Um, And it's the same with 20 bucks. Um, To some people that might not be very much, to some people it it might be a lot, but the objective truth is how many Pokemon cards can I buy with 20 bucks or or something something very solid. And that's also very useful Um, because there is also, I, I think the temptation then for the people who hold sort of those subjective tools to just not care about the objective, but well, what happens when we don't do that? Well, we just kind of fall into like we started with an us versus them mentality. Like, mm. oh, it has to be, it's true for me, but it doesn't have to be true for you. But if you don't agree that it's true for you, then that's a problem. That's kind of a gotcha scenario there. Um, I, I can see that playing out not so great in a number of ways, because yeah. really, if it's true for me, but it doesn't have to be true for you, but it also has to be true for you, uh, it, it's not really fair. Uh, but but also, there are some things that they're kind of not changing no matter how you feel about them. And I don't say that to, to denounce your feelings, but like if I have a cup full of rat poison, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. it it's going to, to kill you. And I want you to know that because I don't want you, I don't want you to die. So we, we've got to find a way to then let the, the subjective truth and the objective truth kind of do a little dance. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that tension is important in, in a lot of things. I mean, we're Lutherans, so we're kind of comfortable with the idea that there are going to be these tensions, but it's, it's tempting though, to just let one win out over the other and they can maybe take turns, but you know, we're, we're going to, when it comes to things you can touch and measure like gravity, there can be an objective truth. But when it comes to things like whether or not there's a God, um, then, then only the subjective can rule and we, we're not allowed to have an outside weighing in opinion um, or, or, or fact. So how do we start to let uh, the, the subjective and the objective mingle? without foregoing that tension okay can you ask that in a different way yeah (laughs) that's that's wow dude i i know (laughs) but so like i i say that my faith is based on the fact that christ is risen from the dead like there's a bible passage that says if christ is not risen from the dead your faith is in vain i need a new job it's it's just all for naught. and we are above all to be pity there's an objective truth that a dead guy stopped being dead and that's why there's christianity but also faith 
comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so if you don't believe it, Christ is risen from the dead, what good does it do you? Um, if you don't believe me when I tell you there's ice cream in the freezer, you're just going to be hungry. So we need a place then where sort of that, that inside out knowledge can also deal with that outside in knowledge, that, that idea that I can interact with the world around me and I'm allowed to feel feelings about it without trying to overwrite what's real just because I don't like it. Um, I think it actually comes back to that thing you said, that um, disagreement is not the same thing as disrespect. We need to yeah. make that clear. How can we maybe make that clear so that we can do this? Um, well, one of the things would be to approach everything that you do and say in love. Mm -hmm. So, like, I know um, as Christians, we probably hear that a lot. Do all things in love. Do all things in love. But the, there's a reason we say that. And um, so someone, you could be talking to someone who fundamentally disagrees with everything that you say, and they might get nasty about it, but that's not really your worry. Your worry is, okay, why are they saying these things? Why do they feel like this is their truth? Why is this what they're clinging to? And then kind of use what they're, where they're coming from and in love say, well, no, this is what I believe. Like kind of use it from that angle so that they have that chance to actually speak and tell you what they think is true. And then you can kind of bring in, well, this is what I think. That's actually a, a really important thing. So um, you, you, you said something that's altogether too compassionate for me to come up with. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal it then. Um, you said that uh, when, when we sort of come across somebody who's, who's nasty to us, why? Um, where I just wanna deal with the objective reality of they were mean and so I don't have to like them anymore. But you actually said, well, if you're trying to deal with subjectivity, maybe don't denounce the subjective and try to ask, why are they, why are they having a hard time with this? Um, it's not that the objective should replace the subjective. If you're going to find any comfort at all in your faith, there needs to be a subjective experience with it. Um, it's just, we don't measure that subjective experience. And so whether or not you feel on fire for the Lord, he's still risen from the dead, but also we, 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 we preach Christ crucified so that we can have comfort in the midst of this stuff. So why are they wrestling with these things? That, that might actually be the first question. So we, we need to then start to, to find a way to deal with subjective truth. I, and that doesn't just mean sort of, here's all the places you're wrong, but, but what else can it be? Um, like it can be places where you're right too, like the exact opposite. Like you can believe, like someone could tell me that your truth is subjective, that Jesus rose from the dead. I don't believe that. So I don't have to believe that. But we believe that that truth that they see as a um, subjective is objective. So how do we kind of flip that on its head and be like, no, the truth that you see as subjective, you really don't have a choice. It's there whether you like it or not, like gravity. You can't just say, oh, I don't feel like being weighed down by gravity today. I'm going to float. You, you can't do that. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I, I understand um, that there are things that are true that don't affect my life. Um, but, but there are things that are true that do and, and not liking them or agreeing with them can't change that. Um, it, it's, it's maybe that other side of love. Um, that, that love isn't simply being kind or, or compassionate, but love is actually um, being honest. Uh, not, not, not a jerk, but, but honest. And so um, I, I tell my kids when they're wrong not because I like making them cry, uh, but because I want them to actually not get hurt by things. Um, and so if I see my kid playing in the street, I'm going to say something. Even if, even if she thinks she's doing nothing wrong, I don't want her to get hit by a truck. Um, so how you talk to them about this thing is it, it's very much shaped by compassion, by, by kindness, by, by mercy. Um, but also the, the idea that, that um, love is just sort of letting anything that you disagree with go it's it, it's it's not true if these these things that we're talking about are of consequence. Yeah. So, can I? Am I wrong for sort of thinking that there are some people that I am just more prone to talking about these things with than others? You know what no, I mean? No, like some people kind of give you the the vibe, I guess, of like 
they're ready to be receptive to what you're saying. Some people, you can't talk to a brick wall. So like if some, if someone is so said, like hard set in what they believe, how they believe it, why they believe it, and they don't want to listen to anybody else, they're not going to listen to anybody else, no matter how hard you try. So um, you just kind of have to look at that person again in kindness and see like, okay, well, maybe there's a place that they're struggling. Maybe this is the, that little crack of sunshine poking through that brick wall that you can kind of take hold of and be like, well, here, here's this, here's this truth. Might not feel comfortable. You might not like it, but it's there anyway. And we get to recognize and there, there are places where these discussions won't be fruitful. I'm going to just sort of label those Twitter. Um, and there are places where they, they might actually be where, where people in, in our lives that we've been given to care about are, are struggling with the wages of sin and, and, and death and the grave. And we actually hold uh, the answer that is Christ who has risen from the dead. Um, we can we can broach people with different worldviews, um, even just starting with the idea that I don't agree with you, but I still love you. I, I don't have disrespect for you. And, and me thinking different things than you isn't, isn't a condemnation of, of you as a person. Um, but it, it's, it's that I'm, I'm approaching this from a different place. And, and so I can talk to you about it. And I'd like to talk to you about it, but there's a big difference between helping and winning. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, definitely like that this it becomes all the more apparent when it's actually somebody you care about right so if it's if it's that unhelpful place that is hypothetically called twitter um i I understand that there's not a lot of room for help you just have to win right um but is it different when there's actually people you care about yeah because you don't give up on people you care about like on the internet or you know that unhelpful place called twitter um there you only have so many characters, words, whatever that you can say, and you have to make your point and you have to make it almost zing the other person. So it's like, this is what I believe, slap right in the face. And that's not necessarily- How does that that make their life better? (laughs) Yeah, like that doesn't help anything. That just makes them, if anything, like why, this is what always confuses me about like short little captions on like the internet or like anywhere or just a drive-by sentence of, well, I was listening to your conversation and this is what I have to add. Like um, all of those things are just there to stir someone up. It doesn't really help them go, huh? And really let them think about what you've just said because they're already angry. And then you're adding that sentence in and then maybe that is not what they needed to hear. And they're like, oh, all these Christians, they think they're better than us. Like, it, it's just not helpful. You need to go through and like, especially if you care about that person, you need to be like, okay, can we talk about this? Like, sit down and talk. Do you have 15 minutes? Do you have 20 minutes? Do you just want to um, call each other, let the phone stay on, go about our days and just kind of chat. Like, what do you want to do? How can I make it better? How can I help? Rather than the, here, I have this, I need to say it to you. You need to accept it right now because I just said it right now. So giving that little bit of grace, kind of that grace period of thought so that they actually have time to think about what you just said instead of immediately feeling like they have to formulate an answer and fire back. That's really important. Um, So so helping is uh, about the other person. Winning is about me, but also winning is about right now. Um, But but helping might be a longer term thing. So if I'm actually trying to help somebody, um, it doesn't need to be settled today, does it? No, it could take years, like months, years, days. It could take seconds, but not likely. But... Let the Lord worry about that. That's not your problem. You're not mm-hmm. Lord of time. I, I'm not time Lord. That'd be a cool superhero, but I am not that person. Um, and so when it then it comes to the idea then that that uh, we, we have this this way and the truth and the life that is Jesus, that that's not a compromising truth. And what we're not saying, we're, we're not saying compromise, but but we are saying this way and truth and life named Jesus 
Well, he spent a lot of time talking to people that didn't believe him. Why did he do that? You know what I mean? Like, why would Jesus spend time talking to people he knew would reject him in that instant, unless maybe there was something more going on? Well, it kind of, that kind of reminds me of a quote that I had just seen. It says um, that it's better to hear the truth than go about your life in error. So it's better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals rather than falsehood that comforts and then kills. Completely. And I can't, I can't remember who said it, but I just saw it on the grand old internet before this meeting. And like, I was like, that's so, that it works because like, that's what Jesus did. He didn't come to be liked. If he did, we'd all be Christians, but the whole back, like we're sinful and we need someone who's perfect, who cares enough about us to be okay with not being liked because he knows that the truth that is within him and the truth that is the word made flesh is what we need. And so he was ready to come down and he did come down at any and all costs to save his people. Right. So um, I, I think we need to actually recognize that um, it, it's not simply just it, it's better uh, not to remain in air. Like, I, I hope somebody tells me if I have a booger hanging out of my nose, um, like like the idea that the things that we uh, are, are doing are always the things that we don't mean to do. Because like, I, I, I don't on purpose have a booger hanging out of my nose. But if I do, I hope you'll tell me so I can take care of all of that and then be mortified by it for the next 30 years. Uh, but um, I, I think it's not just, you said, if, if um, Jesus were just here to do the things we like, we'd all be Christian. But then you have to actually answer the question, do we always like the things that are good for us? You know what I mean? Well, like if yeah, Jesus no. were just here to give us the things that we like, um, that that's not necessarily a, a Jesus who actually loves us. Um, your, uh, uh, not yours, a drug dealer gives you the things that you like, uh, but that's not healthy. Um, and so um, in the same way, if we just had a, a Jesus who showed up and gave us everything that we wanted, like a vending machine so that we could sort of pry more vice out of him, even as we hurt ourselves and the people around us, well, Christianity then isn't a salvific religion. It's just a race to the bottom in I, I I don't know numb bliss. Yeah, something like that. It Empire. definitely wouldn't make sense. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, really, if Christianity is just sort of about how happy can you get it, it becomes an inherently selfish religion. Mm -hmm. It has to be because some of the things that make me happy are real bad for the people around me. We, we call those sin. Uh, that sin breaks stuff. It, it, you might not always see how it does, but but these things are sort of uh, th these things are called sin by God because they break His creation. And if you happen to have to share that creation with me, it might just affect your life. So if if it's not simply about happiness, uh, what are we talking about? Because like it's not just I, I would really like to make your day less happy. Can I tell you about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Um, <laughs> what do I what do I what am I aiming at? You're I almost think that you're aiming at the uncomfortable. Like you want to poke that piece that because everyone like we're all sinful we we're all born into sin the thing though is everyone has that like everyone has the need for a savior even if they don't know it so you kind of use that uncomfortableness of the person who thinks oh I just if everything's going great then I don't need Jesus I can just go by myself because whatever I'm doing it must be good because everything's good and kind of take that and be like, no, that's not what we're called to. We're called to the uncomfortable. Like Christianity is a call to the uncomfortable. Because if it was a call to the comfortable, like you said, it'd just be a self-serving religion and we'd all be on the race downwards. And we kind of have to, I know it's a kind of cliche um, saying in Christianity, but take up our cross and actually like it is a cliche for a reason and um like crosses are uncomfortable that's allowed yeah I, I mean that's the whole point but also crosses are unavoidable oh, either yeah, somebody definitely. else is going to carry one for you or, or sooner or later you're going to have to pay the wages of sin like it, it, it's not a uh this will be a fun thing for me to tell you about but it, it's a this is a necessary thing and so when we approach then somebody, just to kind of wrap things up, um, we, we recognize there are people who have a different understanding, a different belief, a different truth than, than us. What do we do? Approach them in love. Like we've been saying, kind of circle back and just, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable, but maybe that's a cross that you need to share with that person. Like they don't know that they need this truth. 
So they're struggling and maybe they're struggling and they don't know why they're struggling. And then that's where you can come in and really help them with that as a Christian in our Christian love and our Christian faith and truth. Yeah. Care more about the person than being right. And then recognize that maybe you, you've got the words that, that can sort of help somebody along, but it's Jesus who saves sinners, not you. And, and so relax, recognize that it, it, it's not such a terrible burden to, to actually be given the, the truth that, that saves and people who you have in your life that you care about. Um, maybe you actually get to sometimes painfully, but um, always gently talk about the things that matter because well, if they matter, they're worth talking about. Exactly. Paige, thanks so much for coming on the Drive School podcast. Thank you. Have a good one.